but the hardest time that I had in the last 30 days of preparing for this message here. It's not going to be about in the days, this one, but um, this is about persecution. And um, But the spiritual warfare that I had a face to prepare for this one was very difficult because I had to go back into my childhood and uncover some certain things that were about my life. Hallelujah. And before I can even deliver a message to you guys, God takes me through that journey. Thank you. So um, this is going to be uh, something that we as a church has not talked about and not brought up because we don't live in a foreign country to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure out what our persecution is. What it is that we are persecuted about. All right? So um, I'm going to read the scriptures. As, uh, so John 13, chapter 20. Um, I'm going to take my time if you don't mind. Because this, this one is going to be pulling some stuff out. So we can all be delivered. Because that's what it's all about. It's about getting delivered, right? So, uh, remember and continue to remember that I told you a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. Hallelujah. Uh, now, I, I would like to ask, how many of y'all know what persecution really means? Amen. What does it mean? We don't, this is going to be like a class participation here. This is, where did, got you other mics? Okay. That's good. Okay. Any others? Persecution. Condemn. Condemn. Right. Guilty. Guilty. Well, you're innocent, right? Of your sins. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Suffering. Suffering. But the persecution is hostility and ill treatment, especially because of race or political or religious beliefs. That's the same definition y'all gave. Right? <laughs> the nature of persecution is found in the Old Testament and the New Testament with examples of two main types. There are really four types of persecution, but I'm only going to cover two today. All right. All right, it's physical and mental. And then you have social and spiritual. But I'm only going to cover physical and mental today. Okay. All right. A godly testimony will often result in ridicule, scorn, deprivation, physical harm, and even death. Amen. Jesus and his disciples were insulted, mistreated, That's deprived, right. Right. clothed in sheepskin and goatskin. Right. Now, when they were clothed in sheepskin and goatskin during that time, it was because wolves was going to eat them. So when they clothed them in goatskin and sheepskin, they had to clothe. They put it. They put them with goatskin and sheepskin, and were fed to wolves because of their belief in Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. They were persecuted. Uh, wandering in the desert and mountains, in caves, holes in the ground, was tortured, sawed into two, jailed, flogged, chained, put to death by the sword. They were thrown into fire and stoned to death. Now I'm going to go with the story of Stephen, Acts 7 and 20, 54 through 60. This is just the end of Stephen's life. And I'm, I'm going to show you how Stephen dealt with persecution. Now when they heard this accusation and understood its implication, they were cut to the heart and they began grinding their teeth in rage at him. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit and led by him, gazed into heaven and saw the glory, the great splendor and majesty of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand of God. 
And he said, look, I see the heavens open up and welcome. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. But they shouted with loud voices and covered their ears together, rushed at him, considering him guilty of blasphemy. Then they drove him out of the city and began stoning him. And a witness placed their outer robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They continued stoning Stephen as he called unto the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive in itself and welcome my spirit. Then falling on his knees in worship, he cried out loudly, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Do not charge them. When he said this, he fell asleep and dealt. Now, why I pulled this story out is because Stephen was a deacon in the house of God. And um, this is when the church first started, right? So when Stephen began to give the testimony of Jesus Christ, it pricked on the heart of man. And man began to hurt by it, get hurt by their heart. But their heart wasn't right. So it pricked on their heart, right? So um, so when Stephen was, was stoned, he did something that was so powerful. He looked at God and said, God, please don't count this sin against them. Well, because they didn't know what they was doing. Well, 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 man. So, this is what Stephen's account was, and this is what we should do with our persecutors. We should pray for them, right? Yes. Amen. So, what is physical persecution? We're going through the physical persecution, and um, I'm going to bring my wife up later on, and she's going to tell you some testimonies as well. Um, give you her insight from a woman's perspective um, because sometimes men we think we know what women think about but we really don't know have no idea so <laughs> we're going to bring my wife up um, when I get down further into the no clue, into the <laughs> no clue <right? laughs> uh, physical persecution includes taking on others life maiming the body molestation and abandonment rape, domestic violence, and imprisonment. That's physical persecution. That's, the, that's what we go through as physical persecution. When it comes to Christians in today's church in the United States of America, we have freedom of religious choice. That means you can choose to worship a tree or a rock without being judged by man or thrown into prison of your choice. For your choice. In other countries, they don't have that choice. Amen. They are killed for being a Christian. Right. This is the only religion that you got that dies. So when in Hinduism, they don't kill you for serving a Hindu god. In Buddhism, they don't kill you for serving a Buddhist. In Islam, they don't kill you for being Islam. Come on. Islam killed themselves for being Islam. Come on. Come on. In Christianity, in other countries, they kill you for serving Christ. Well, this is the only religion that's being persecuted. Just because you go into the airport as an Islam, don't mean and people don't look at you funny, don't mean you've been persecuted. Right? That's right. So So they are stoned to death in other countries, shot in the head, hung for choosing Christ. Over Islam and any other religion. That's right. That's right. Uh, just a good little bit of that was I was in Iraq, uh, two combat tours in Iraq, and on my first combat tour, uh, people we would have church service and we would have this guy come by and he he would whisper that he's a Christian because he was an Islam country. He had to whisper that, whisper that he was a Christian. He couldn't say it out loud because they would kill him. Mm-hmm. So it's real in other countries. Yes. This happens today. Right. There are underground churches. There are underground yes. places that worship in a cage. Um, I had a video I showed my wife and my kids the other day of a church in China mm-hmm. that would worship in a cave. They couldn't Same. serve God Same. like we can. So, prison persecution is supposed to break your will of choice and your stance to serve Christ. That's the whole reason why they persecute you physically is supposed to break your will. So your will can be broken. Come on. 
And then now, let's look at America. Because we in America, we don't face this kind of persecution, right? Uh, if we had the land, if we are the land of the free, that must our, what must our persecution be? If it's not losing a job, it's not losing a job, right? That's, that's so, like, you know, that's not on the scale of persecution because you lost a job, right? That's, we got to get that straight. Uh, it's not losing a house or a car. Because those are material things. We're talking about what's going to break your spirit, man, from serving Christ. Not materialistic things. Yeah, because you can always get another house. You can always get another car. Yeah, right. you better preach, man. So, let's, let's look at this. The persecution that we face in is more diabolical than being stoned. Because it happens in our childhood. Our young adult life. We are raped molested, have abortions, right. thrown into prison, uh -huh. and even bullied. Mm -hmm. So when we come to the age of to know Christ, we suffer for knowing Christ. Uh -huh. But we don't know him really. Right, 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 right. We so don't really we can't get to know him really because we don't trust him. Don't trust him. Because of what we went through as a child. And somehow the church has lost that. They don't even talk about that. Sure, it's all concerned with moving on, home, moving ahead, moving ahead, moving ahead, but they never deal with the issues of your past. Come on. And we got to dig that up. And today we're going to dig it up. We're going to get to the root. So you can have the fullness of joy. So you're going to walk around here looking for happiness. Come on. The Bible said you need joy. Yes. You're talking about joy. You need joy, right? Because joy lasts longer than happiness. Yes. Happiness is only a feeling. It goes away. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Take your time. Now you can you can't fully submit to Christ's authority or even submit to any type of leadership. This physical persecution that we face as a child, it won't allow us to submit to God. It won't allow us to submit to even 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 leadership. When you go on your job, and sometimes you go on your job, you can't understand why the boss is telling you to do certain things because you can't submit to leadership because what happened to you when you was five? That's right. You can't submit. Glory to God, hallelujah. So you lose your job based off what you did at five. Mm. What happened to you at five? And you don't even your fault. Mm. So look, let's go through mental persecution because mental persecution is a part byproduct of physical persecution. Mental persecution is mental abuse, drug abuse, alcoholism, depression, overeating, isolation, rejection. The spirit of heaviness, unforgiving, lack of family support, pornography, hopelessness is all part of mental persecution. And it destroys you as you grow up because of what you went through as in your childhood. Amen. So when we told that the biggest battle that we face in our Christian wall is the battle of the mind. There are more Christians taking depression medication than any other religious group. Amen. <laughs> now, we serve a God that's supposed to deliver us. Come on. But how can we serve a God that's supposed to deliver us if we pop in prescription medication? Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way that we do this is because we don't deal with our past. We don't trust God enough to even break it. Right? So we got to trust God to break this. I hope y'all get this because this is yeah. this is heavy. This is going to protect these kids too. Because as they grow up, they're going to face this kind of persecution also. So uh, there are more Christians taking depression medication than any other religious group. This persecution is tied to our life before we became Christians. And sometimes dealing with physical persecution we face that we faced as a child. Abusing or ingesting certain drugs may provoke delusions and mental breakdown. Amen. Despite what the doctor tell you, those side effects tell you that this is what's going to happen. So every time you take something to, to, to deal with something in your past, you take the medication and the side effect is you're depressed even worse. Have you seen the commercials lately at night? When you sit up at night thinking and you got anxiety, they pop up a commercial and they tell you, like, I don't even know the name of them. There's so many of them. And the side effects is horrible. Suicidal. 
Like, why am I taking medicine that's gonna make me suicidal? Right? But the, the reason for this, it releases a chemical stimulant in the brain. And it's called dopamine. Certain drugs can increase dopamine. Dopamine is an organic chemical that releases into the brain and body that causes an emotional response. It concentrates on the normally high amounts. It, con it concentrates in the normally high amounts, leading a person to feel stimulated or euphoric. This is the reason for most kids are on are smoking weed today. Most grown-ups are smoking weed today. They're starting to legalize weed in certain states because they're trying to get rid of things in their past. They don't want to deal with it. Nobody wants to deal with it, right? Right. So drug use, alcohol use, anything that can bring you to a stimulated or euphoric feeling is tied to dopamine. And this is supposed to be reserved for Christ. That feeling is supposed to be reserved for Christ. So how does this relate to the church? If that is the world, I'm going to get back into the church. How does this relate to the church? You might not be addicted to drugs or alcohol or medication today, but you can be addicted to church. We become addicted to emotional feeling that happens when we come to church. The same feeling that a drug would do is what you do when you come to church. This is why you come to church and, and I ask you, and I ask my wife and my kids this question, how do you know God? So I'm going to ask you, how do you know God? How do you know him? Question. Oh, you asked the question? Yes, ma'am. How do you know him? How do you know God is in the building? How do you know God is this? Well, I know God is real because he uh, revived me back from the dead. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Your life. I, I OD'd. I OD'd by the dope man hand. Uh, I thought I was smoking crack and I was smoking uncut heroin. And he uh, took me on a journey. He couldn't get through to my man, but one thing about it, he got through to me. Amen. And he took me on my journey. And I was up in the, in the, in the, in the clouds. Tell the thing. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, he uh, told me. To, to relax myself and lay my seat back, grab my man hand. I know God is real, Amen. But, but I'm so deep into my sins, the devil try to overpower me from doing what God wants me to do. Amen. And I and I and I, I mistreated my family, my kids, but I'm here today to to give everybody my testimony on how God. Pull me back from the gate. Amen. And I've been trying to go strong for that. Amen. You will. I'm, I'm still suffering. But, uh, but uh, I, I, I can feel more better since I, when I come to this church. Every time I, I just got here from Ohio. Okay. And uh, I feel much better. Because I've been doing drugs to, from a, a sun up to a two, three, four o'clock in the morning on my porch. I even got so deep on it, I went on my front porch and started smoking crack. And the car was going back down the street. So my daughter, she heard about it, and she came to Cleveland and got me for a little while. Because I had a, I was losing out of a lot of control. Of and I know God is real. And you know God is real. I want to say that the way I know God is real, as a praise and worship leader and a woman who is very emotional and worship God with my emotions, with my tears, um, even if I don't feel emotional about it or if I don't cry out to him, I have to know and believe him with my heart and know that even if I don't feel that feeling, that he is with me and that it's okay for me to be emotional, it's okay for me to worship and cry out, but it can't just be that. I have to know that he's real without that feeling. Mm -hmm. So I believe that he's real because I believe him with my heart, not with my head, not with my emotions. Right, and that's kind of what we was covering because it's, some of us believe God in our head, but he wants to reside in our heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. In our mind, we believe God is real, but we never know how real he is until he resides in here. Right? right? Mm -hmm. So, some people become church aholics. Going to four, sometimes five meetings a week. 
We confuse attending church with being a Christian that Christ called us to be. Worship, fellowship, and discipleship are all vital, but not at the expense of losing your family. That's right. That's right. So we grew up in a day, or I grew up in a day where church was priority for everything, even family. Like, people would spend more time at church than they would sit down at family dinner talking to their kids. And then they wonder why their kids don't want Christ. Because you neglected them That's for right. church. Hallelujah, preach the word. So you neglected them, yeah. right? So now your kids going into games and going into other things because now you done neglected them because you in church seven times a week. And they don't want God. They don't want it. Because if they feel like if you can put God... Oh, we're not even God. You put church mm -hmm. over them. They can't understand that. That's right. They don't get that comprehension. They, they don't get it. They don't get it. Comprehend. They can't comprehend that. No. no. Like, where are mom and daddy at? At church again? Really? Like, mom, I'm feeling in class. Can right. you see me? Right. Right. I need to talk to you. Yeah. I got a boyfriend at 12. Yeah. We having sex in the house while you go to church. That's right. Preach it. Can you, can you see me? Do you see me? Do you know I'm here? Mm. Glory to God, yeah. preach the word. So we don't, we do that as adults. And then when our kids get older, they don't want Christ. Because they like, man, I want to go to church six times a week. Right? right? So it's vital. It's vital for us to come to church. It's vital for us to fellowship. But at the expense of losing your family, that's not what God really wants. There are some people who will not miss a church event. If the lights are on, they're there. If the lights are on, they still might show up in the dark. <laughs> if someone suggests that service is being called off for any reason, they go into church withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> they literally start withdrawing. <laughs> they, it's like drug addicts. It, it, it's not funny, but it's really people who have withdrawal symptoms because they're so used to that emotional feeling when it comes to church and not really knowing him. Mm -hmm. Right? They, it's a euphoric feeling. So we've been to, I've been to church places and church churches and and I can see people leave, leaving there the same. What's the point of going to church if you leave there the same? Glory to God. If you leave the church building, coming to worship God, and you walk out and you're still depressed. But they in there, man, I mean, they falling all on the floor, they dancing, they shouting, they speaking in the tongues, they doing everything and performing, but they didn't get delivered. That's right. It's only a feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you're addicted to a feeling, you don't know him. Teach him. Right? Teach him. So so many people come to church, want to feel God. <laughs> want to feel him. And some of them won't even come to a church if they don't feel him. Mm. They're like, oh man, I'm not feeling him. He's not here. He's I don't feel him. I don't feel goosebumps when I come in. Yeah, that means you don't know him. That's right. Amen. Because they said where two or three are gathered, he is in the midst. That's right. So if you know him, then he'll be there. But if you come from with villains, and man, you have there would the devil will be there. Because he'll give you a villain. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You can go to a hip hop concert. And think the presence of God is there. Because you got a feeling. And then when you go to church and the praise and worship is good, you start feeling good and like the same thing that you felt when you were in the hip hop concert. And you relate that to the presence of God, but it's just your feelings. I'm not against feeling, but I'm against when you put feeling over knowing. Right? So this is what happens to men when they face persecution as a child. Uh, they men so this is to give you some insight wives on how your husband feels when he faces persecution as a child and he's sometimes isolated he's some kind of reserved he don't give you all of him because he faced this kind of persecution so if a man grows up in a household where the father is very abusive where predators was on the attack Predators are not only molest women, they molest men also, as children. Because they sick and twisted and evil, right? So men go through bouts with authority, 
They have no authority of man, a male figure. They can't, they won't respect a the male. They give all their ideals to a woman. And this is why they have multiple relationships at a young age. Because they're, they don't respect authority. So men will, will go into five or six relationships with a woman or different women, and they call that being a player, but really the inside of that man is tore up because there's nobody dealt with his childhood. Mm. Right? Right. Because he was either molested, he was either sexually abused, physically abused, and he don't like women now. He hate women. This is what happens in a child of, a, of when a man grows up. Then he get addicted to porn, pornography. And then that creates isolation. Because that's secret sin that nobody deals with, nobody talks about. A secret, it's a secret. And anything that's a secret, that secret will cause you to keep it in and hide it and isolate you. Because no one wants to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? This is the things the church ain't talking about. We don't, we don't talk about this kind of stuff. We, we, it ain't been talked about in years. I, when I was going through this, I was like, God, did you, man, that's going to be just No, I can't teach this one. Yes, you can. You can teach it, give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. But then I realized in my childhood, I went through certain things. Mm -hmm. And it made me who I was today. Mm -hmm. And God is constantly trying to change those things. Break those things up, right? So, man... We don't, we don't uh, respect male authority. Uh, we tend to lend our ear towards women to teach us and prophesy to us and pray with us. That's right? We take home a woman's advice. Uh, men will um, get into, into pornography. Uh, we'll go into alcoholism. All right? And all of that is to create that void that happened when he was a child. We create that void. And what we do is we look for things, other things to to enhance us and get us to a level where we can cope with life. So all of this is coping mechanism for men, right? We, we get addicted to sports. We're fanatics at sports. We paint our faces at sports. You know, we, we go to games and even, like, on Sundays, most men won't come to church because they're scared they're going to miss the game on Sunday. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I put a TV on. They won't even come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you have some pastors wearing jerseys on their favorite team. That's right. I went to a church in Indiana, and the Indianapolis Post was playing. This pastor came in his pink man and jersey, and he was like, it's 1230, and it's the playoffs, and um, I'm only going to preach five minutes. Mm. So I hope you get everything in these five minutes. Because I'm out of here. Mm. I know mm. Right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Seen it. Seen it. All right? So this is the this is what's being displayed and this is what God wanna do us deal with us about. Um we, we as men, we also take what we did as a child, what we learned as a child, and we automatically thrust it into our marriage, right? No one taught us. So we take what we see as children thinking that's what's right. And sometimes what we see ain't always what is right. Because no. sometimes our parents deal with things that they've never dealt with and they express it in their adult life. That's right. That's right. So as children, we grow up saying, oh my goodness, so this is what's right. This is how you take over a woman's life. You know what I mean? We become aggressors mm -hmm. instead of let's work together. Compromise. We don't compromise. We become aggressive, right? Um, I won't bring my wife up so she can speak about women, what women go through. Um, Praise God. Praise God. I won't be before you long. Praise but, um, you know, people, we, we look at the outer appearance of people right. and we get a perception in our mind of who they are right. and what they have and what they've been through and what their testimony is, right? right? And um, when people look at me, they always, their perception of me is always wrong. It's always inaccurate. You know, they look at me and even the people who've been around me, they know me, they see me, they say, oh, you're so pretty, you're funny, you're insane, you're talented, you're all these things. 
But what they don't know is that this little girl was neglected, was tossed around in foster care most of her life, mm -hmm. was molested mm -hmm. by a father figure, yep. mm -hmm. um, grew up with a mother who was on drugs, um, a father who was in prison, right. a grandmother, a widower who raised me, and then who died at the age when I was 22. And then I took on to raise my siblings at the age of 23, and it was like five of us. Um, they don't see that you've been through that. That's and right. the way it affects a woman, because I didn't see marriages in my family. Um, I didn't grow up seeing successful marriages. I just knew that I always in my heart prepared myself to be a wife. I knew that um, even, even though I didn't see a way out uh, of my situation and my growing up, I knew that I wanted to be a wife. I knew I wanted to be a woman of God. And I prepared myself that way. And, um, but in the beginning of your marriage, especially when you're young, you just want to be the perfect little wife. So my definition of perfect wife and a Christian woman is make sure the house is clean, which you still do that. Make sure you cook dinner, make sure the kids are situated. You know, you have, you know the image of a wife. You don't know what God wants you to be as a wife and a mother and a child of God. And so many years I go on with this image. Oh, but then a trigger comes and it reminds you of the things that you've buried on the inside, the molestation, the neglect, um, the abuse, the uncertainty, the lack of guidance of, or lack of having a mother. You're trying to be a mother. And later on in, in my marriage, I told you I've been married 14 years late marriage, um, that thing began to creep up. I didn't realize that because I didn't have a father figure um, and I really didn't know God with my heart, I knew how to appear to know him. I know how to worship, I know how to sing, I know how to speak in tongues, I know how to lay hands. But my life didn't reflect that because at the end of the day, I would do all that worshiping and we're not against um, emotions and worshiping because I am the most emotional person you'll ever meet. And I'll cry right now, worship. But I would go home, and then I would go into a dark corner where I just wanted to die. I wanted to commit suicide. I didn't understand why I was so broken when I'm up here singing and people were being touched. People would fall out before God because I would usher in the presence of God, and they would be changed. But I wasn't changed. I would go home, and these depressions and these bouts of depressions where I wanted to just <laughs> end it. And I didn't know why, and God is letting me know because you don't know me, and you don't trust me. And you not only don't trust me, you don't trust the husband that I put before you. And so it caused me to be aggressive. It caused me to think, okay, you can do it better than him. Any idea that he had, I would come up against it. Anything that he asked me to do, I would be in the back of my mind like, hmm, I can do it better. Or any time that he got, I got mad at him, I would think, oh, I can do, I, I can do this without you. I don't need you. But that's not what God wants for us women. He wants us, God bless you with a husband. He wants you to be submissive. And submissive doesn't mean bondage. Submissive means that I'm going to love you with my whole being. That I'm going to submit myself to you and there will be no secret sin. That if I'm struggling with something, you're my best friend. I feel comfortable enough to tell you, babe, I'm struggling and I need you to pray. Because I don't know what's going on inside of me, but I submitted myself to you. So I'm not going to keep a secret from you. That is what true submission is. But the only way to do that as women is to, number one, forgive of the father who may not have been there for you. And you don't have to have him in your life for you to forgive him. To trust the father that made you in heaven and to submit to the husband that God has blessed you with. So thank you for letting me share my testimony. Thank you. Now we're going to go over how to properly respond to persecution. Are y'all getting this? Yeah. Right? So we're going to go over how to deal with the issues of the past. How God tells you to deal with it. So that we can be free. Because the whole point of coming is to be free, right? Mm -hmm. Forbearance. Turn the other cheek. This one's a hard one because as men, if somebody hit me, how many of us would turn the other cheek? How many of us would just be like, we told that we have to have self-defense. If somebody hit you, hit them back. Yeah. I teach my son that. And I was in the era. Yeah. Like my son would literally go to school and somebody hit him. He's not. Somebody touch him. 
and he's knocking them out. I mean, I would teach him how to box at an early age. I was like, you son, you're not going to get bullied in school. I'm going to teach you how to box. So if somebody ever come up to you and hit you, oh, they're going to wish they never hit you. It can be two on one, I'm going to teach you how to handle yourself, right? <laughs> and I was in error. I'm teaching them all the wrong things. <laughs> Cause he come home and be like, Dad, you know, I got in a fight today. I'm like, first question I had, did you win? <laughs> no, no. Like, son, did, did, did you win today? Did you beat him up? And I'm always like, what? What kind of parent is that? What are you doing? Nah, did you win? He like, yeah, Dad, I won. I'm like, yeah. Oh, go in the room, you just thank you later, but you know. But we're in the room, we, I'm clapping like this. You know, that's how you do it, I'm Yeah. I'm teaching them all the wrong things. And not, this is recently. This ain't like years ago. This was like last week. <laughs> this is last week. This is three days ago. You know what I'm saying? This is like, he, now you come home like every day, Dad, I got on a fight today. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> My wife called me, she's like, teacher called me and said, Judah is, I'm like, God. So, turn out the cheek. You got to teach your kids to turn out the cheek. Because as men, we told them not to, we told them to defend ourselves. You know, I was in the military. All I did was defend myself. You know, you told them to defend yourself. For I say to you, do not resist. This is scripture. Now, I'm coming to scripture right here. For I say to you, do not resist an evil person who insults you or violates your rights. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other towards him also. Simply ignore insignificant insults or trivial losses and do not bother to retaliate. Maintain your dignity and self-respect and your poise. So if somebody slapped you, it's okay. Maintain your poise. Maintain your dignity. That's part of being Christ-like. So we as men, we already know, like, man, it's a, he talking about that. Brother. Somebody, if I walk out this door today and somebody hit me in my face, I am not gonna turn over the cheek. But that's all pride, though. That's a pride issue. I said because at the end of the day, when we watch basketball, we watch NBA, and it's always a guy who's who's second to get the the worst offense. It ain't the guy who started it, it's the guy that hit back, that gets suspended, that lose money. Right, that's right. So even in some cases as men, we, we want to hit back, mm -hmm. even though the Bible tells us to turn out the cheek. Well. Right? Yeah. Mercy. 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 God shows us grace and mercy every day. Yes, he does. But mercy is a big one. We don't want to give mercy. Show you how you give mercy. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. That's right. And doing this, <laughs> when he burning coals on his head. Give you an example. When your child has been killed by another, most mothers don't forgive the person that did it. Fathers don't forgive the person that did it. Go put money on his books. Because the Bible tells you beat him. Mm. Mm. That's right. Don't beat him. That's the word. Put money on his commissary. That's the word. Because that's the word. It says that. Beat him. That's right. If he starts to give him a drink. Because in his mind, when that happens, and the mother and the father come in and put money on his books, because he ain't got no money to eat, he's going to be devastated. He's going to remember what he did. His conscience is going to be seared with that. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be set free in your forgiveness. That's right. That is right. And he's going to have to deal with that. That's right. That's right. Because the Bible said that he will be burning coals on his head. That means in his mind there will be burning coals mm -hmm. of what he did. The persecution, the things that he did. Mm -hmm. And that's worse. The any judgment that you can do. That's right. And that's what's keeping you from growing. Exactly. It's keeping you hindered. It's hindering your growth exactly. when this happens. When you ain't able to forgive. Right. And show mercy to your accusers. Right. Even if somebody molested you or treated you bad and they was hungry, feed them. Because that break that will burn a human coal on their head. That's exactly right. right? Love. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 
love them. Love them means love them. Love them with a sincere love that they will give their life back to God. Right? Love them. Right? Confidence. Have confidence. Have confidence that God is going to be the avenger. And repay, says the Lord. It's mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. That's Romans 12 and 19. Love scripture is Matthew 5 and 44. And in mercy is Romans 12 and 20. Uh, having confidence. That means assurance that God is going to avenge the persecution. That God is going to avenge the father that hurt you. Father, God is going to avenge the mother that hurt you. God is going to avenge anyone that persecuted you. Anyone that abandoned you. God is going to avenge that. And the avengers ain't always what you think it is. It ain't always that person going to die. The vengeance is that person going to do something and give their life to God. That's right. There you go. Because God don't want souls to go to hell. That's he right. never intended for that. That's right. Preach he, it up. Preach it. Jesus Christ died for that already. Right? right? Mm -hmm. And realization. Fifth one. Realization. If they persecute me, they will persecute you also. That's the realization. That's how you know that you are a Christian. Because sometimes when we kids, we don't really, we don't know. I think, honestly, I believe, and this is my belief, and if y'all want to bear witness with me, y'all can, but I believe that somehow demons and devils have been around for 2000, over 2,000 years. They've been around since the beginning, since the fall of man, right? That means they know certain things that we don't know. That's right. They tap in certain levels of of God and, and on the second heavens or third heavens, they can tap in certain areas of our lives that we didn't know. So how could it be that what you went through as a child could be the byproduct of what you wanna what what the Satan don't want you to become? Right? Wow. And Satan know that you was gonna be a preacher of the gospel. Because he probably has some insight because there are some things that that you do, that you talk to people about, that you told somebody a dream about, and say to them, like, hold on, I'm going to plan an evil device that's going to cripple this person so he won't do what God called him to do. You better say it. You better say it. There's something in his life that it, it's a moment of clarity. It's a moment that as a child that you have that, I'm going to worship God, and God calling me to preach, and God calling me to prophet, be a prophet. God calling me to do certain things, and I have a dream. Let me go tell somebody in my family. And as soon as you tell that person, because you're young and you don't know what to do with it, the enemy grabs that thought, and then he plants the seed of destruction into your life. So that when you get older, you won't do the will of God. Right? That's realization. That's not persecution, right? So this is another how you properly respond to persecution. Concentration on Jesus Christ. Let us face our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith. That's Hebrews 12, 2. That means concentrate on Jesus. When you're going through something, you put your mind on Jesus Christ so that you'll get through it. Not on the circumstances that you're going through. Sometimes when we go through something in our in our lives, we kind of concentrate on that circumstance. We're so busy looking at that that we don't let God deal with it. Right? We're so busy looking at it. Right. Man, I just lost my car this week. Oh, I'm going to get to work. I got to do certain things. I got to get to the doctor. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And your whole focus for a whole day is concentrated on the problem instead of the person that can fix it. That's right. That's right. Instead of the one that can give you favor to handle that and get through that. Even if it's, even if you don't fix it right away, he gives you a piece to be able to go through it. And that's, more, that's better than fixing it. That's right. When you have peace about something that goes wrong in your life. Right? right? So concentration on Jesus. A firm stand with, a, have a firm stand with Paul and the apostles. So most of us, when we go through persecution, we don't pick up the Bible and read it and figure out why we're facing this stuff. Why are we going through what we're going through? We don't pick up the Bible and read it. But have a firm stand with Paul and the other apostles. Paul said, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, the righteous judge. 
will award to me on the day, on that day, and not only to me, but also all those who have long for the period. This is 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. This is Apostle Paul telling Timothy that I have hope and good part of faith. So I'm willing to go to the end with this. This is my proclamation to God. I have fought the good fight of faith. If they take me out tomorrow, I have done all that I can do. I'm ready. I don't fought the good fight of faith. Right? That's the race that we have to have. That's the thought we have to have. In everything we go through, we have to have that same desire and that same mindset. If tomorrow, if I die tomorrow, then I fought the good fight of faith. Right? We shouldn't be scared of death. No, we shouldn't be scared of death. Because that's what the that's what part of the body is trying with the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be scared of it. Nope, nope. But we talk to fear. Movies teach us to fear death. Mm -hmm. Video games teach us to fear death. We're so concerned with how we're gonna die that we don't live for today. Amen. A doctor told you that you might die tomorrow, and we'll hold on to that doctor's word and not God's word. So what happens? We die tomorrow. And that's the evidence in Saul. If you look at Saul when he went to talk to the witch of Endor, he told him, he told the witch, he was like, um, I need you to conjure up uh, Samuel. Please bring Samuel back. Mm -hmm. And because what happened, and then the, then the familiar spirit Samuel showed up. It wasn't Samuel, because he was already gone. Right. A familiar spirit showed up and told Saul, you're going to die tomorrow. And Saul said, you know what? I guess I'm going to die tomorrow. I'm going to fall into the hand of the Philistines. And before the Philistines came to get to him, Paul, Saul committed suicide. He committed suicide. He lived out the very thing that somebody told him. And sometimes we are living out the very thing somebody told us. And somebody told you we weren't going to be nothing, that's what we do. We live it out. We ain't going to be nothing. And somebody told us that we was not going to make it till we 25. You're going to be just like your daddy. You're going to be just like your mama. You're going to be on drugs. You're going to be addicted. You're going to be this. We live it out. We live out what people are speaking to our lives instead of what God tells us. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. So we all lived it out. Jesus. And then we wonder why the consequences are so severe. So we bury, we live out what 